So coming back to what uh, the story that we want to tell uh, as a company, uh, our mission statement is to embed cell metabolism in the drug discovery efforts across industry and academia. So the outline of this uh, presentation today will be uh, where we will discuss our approach to metabolism and uh, we will use a case study, uh, in this case murine macrophage polarization to illustrate that our approach is effective. I uh, will briefly touch upon the challenges of uh, this approach uh, which I uh, believe most of this people in this room would appreciate. And finally, uh, we'll talk about poly, which is our solution which addresses many of these challenges that we'll uh, identify. Now, uh, the audience in this room does not meet, need much convincing to uh, you know, make the case that metabolism is indeed uh, a very uh, critical part of understanding a cellular phenotype. It is the integrated and functional readout and also very proximal to the cellular phenotype that you observe. And if you step back, any discovery starts with an observation of a phenotypic uh, distinction. And if you want to understand that phenotypic dis uh, distinction at a molecular level, metabolism is a very good bet to focus your energies and efforts on. That is something that is core to what we believe as a company, and uh, there's a big community that we work with to illustrate that point. Now, to, uh, again, to establish this point, we'll use a case study. In this case, uh, macrophages. These are naive macrophages derived from the mouse and uh, upon different type of stimuli, in this case IF and gamma plus LPS and in this case IL-4 or IL-13, you wait for 24 hours and you get distinctly different functional phenotypes of macrophages. In one case you get what is known as M1, they are classically activated and in a very simplistic description they kill, they kill stuff. In the second case you get what is known as M2, alternatively activated macrophages and again in a very simplistic description they fix stuff. So you have killers and you have fixers. Very distinct functional phenotypes. Our goal is to understand how this functional phenotype comes about at a molecular level. And again as I have said uh, a few times already that metabolism is a good bet to understand this functional distinction. And this is the approach that we have used so far in many cases and it has uh, been a very effective one. And uh, it boils down to two very simple questions. One is in, a ca in cases where you don't know much about the system, you want to approach that in an agnostic fashion. And uh, that, you know, uh, the way we articulate that is going broad. What, it this, what this means is, uh, I, I think the points are not very visible, is uh, you have a list of 9,000 or 16,000 metabolites and reactions in a hypothetical mouse cell. Now, not all of them are relevant in the system that you are studying. So how do you reduce this list of reactions to the most relevant 50 reactions or 100 metabolites that your data would point you to? So that we call going broad. Once you have done that, essentially you have reduced to uh, a list of interesting pathways that are changing in the system that you care about. And once you have that pathway, you can choose to go deep. And that essentially means a qualitative or in some cases, a quantitative characterization of flow of nutrients through this pathway that you've identified. So together, this uh, you know, gives you a suite of uh, tools and approach to study any biological system uh, with success. Again, we'll go back to the macrophage example, which we also published in collaboration with Argius and WashU at St. Louis, uh, where we studied how macrophages derived from uh, macro mouse polarize. Again, uh, we'll touch upon this uh, briefly introducing the biological system. You have naive macrophages, you expose them to some stimuli, IF and gamma plus LPS, you get M1s which kill, you expose them to IL-4, IL-13, you uh, wait for 24 hours, you get M2 which fix. And when we started working on this, uh, both of these polarizations were very poorly characterized, more so with respect to their metabolomic angle of the story. So what we did was we developed an integrated omics workflow. And this uh, is the schema that uh, I borrowed from the paper that was published, has two distinct elements. For one, we focused a lot of energy to prepare the samples as consistently as possible. So the macrophages uh, derived from the mouse were, developed, uh, were uh, grown by the same scientist on the same plate, same day, on a 96 well plate. The samples were treated identically until the point of extraction. And at that point, you sent half your samples for global metabolomic profiling, 
and you send the other half of the samples for global transcriptional profiling. So that was element number one. The second element is, uh, it's pretty straightforward to get uh, the data out of this uh, metabolomic profile and also from the transcriptional profile. We take an additional input of uh, network information that you get from KEG or any such publicly available database. And these three inputs are the ingredients for your computational model, which we argue allows you to generate hypothesis from these complex data sets in a rather interesting way. So that is the second new element of this workflow. We'll go into both of them in uh, some detail shortly. Now, once you have the hypothesis, you can design subsequent experiments. They could be labeling experiments or any phenotypic perturbation experiment to probe and test and validate the hypothesis that you posed early on. So let's take a closer look. Uh, the samples were prepared uh, you know, con as consistently as possible. You did global metabolic profiling. At Arduous, we had streamlined uh, the data analysis uh, part where within a few hours of this run, you'd get a volcano map for all the possible com pairwise comparisons in your experiment. And uh, once you have that, you can uh, identify, you know, let's, in this case, itoconic acid is going up in M1 compared to M0. You PubMed it, you find, you know, there are a lot of papers out there in, from multiple labs which talks about itoconic acid in the context of macrophages. You feel good about your experiment, but it's not clear at this point as to what the next experiment should be. You have a list of metabolites which are going up and down, but it's not very clear as to what they tell you about the biology. And uh, a very similar story holds for the transcriptional data, which again, uh, once you have the RNA-seq file, within a few hours, you can generate a heat map like this. And much like the metabolomic uh, part, you have bands of genes which are going up in M1 and not in M2, and vice versa. But in ad in nothing uh, about this list of genes or list of metabolites tells you what that next experiment should be. So that is a bottleneck that we wanted to address, uh, which brings us to the second element of our integrated omics workflow, which is COMBI-T. COMBI-T is a you know, nickname that we put uh, for uh, this mathematical model that we put in place. And again, today I'll, I'll be uh, very qualitative in the description of uh, the, the model. So there are three ingredients. Uh, one, we start with KEG. We can replace KEG with any publicly available database. Uh, and uh, for all, effectively for this discussion, what KEG sim uh, symbolizes is a, it's a list of reactions that make up a hypothetical mouse cell, or it could be a human cell. And what you see here, uh, the nodes, the circles are metabolites and edges, which are lines connecting two nodes, are genes. In the next step, we score KEG. And the way we do that is we compute the p-value for any pairwise comparison that you want to do in your experiment for the metabolomic data. And we assign that number as the score for the nodes. And remember, edges are the genes. And we recompute re the p-value the, from the transcriptional data for the same comparison. And we assign that number as a score for the edges. So at this point, I have scored my keg based on the data that I have generated. Then I move on to the next step, where a simple optimization process is run. And here we are trying to optimize two different things. One, how good is your p-value, and how well connected are you in keg? And again, in different words, let's say you find a metabolite which has a very stellar p-value, but its substrate or its product or connecting enzymes are not changing. I choose not to care about it. Okay. But if that metabolite has a substrate which has also a good p-value, the connecting transcript has a good p-value too, I say I'm interested and I want to follow up this more. And once I do that, I keep growing my subnetwork until I find the subset of KEG which is most changing and also most connected. That, we argue, this output is a very good place to engage with your data and come up with interesting hypotheses. So let's see what it looks like for uh, the comparison of M1 versus M2. Now this slide is uh, data dense, so let's spend a few seconds just getting oriented uh, with this uh, slide. So again, as before, the nodes, the circles that you see are metabolites. The lines connecting them are edges, which are uh, coming from the genes or enzymes. And uh, the green color means up in M1. Red means up in M2 or down in M1. The colors of the lines uh, also say, mean the same thing. There's yet another layer of information, which is the thickness of the node. So the bigger the node means better the p-value. So your eyes are automatically drawn to the most interesting part. So here you see itoconic acid is big and green, means it's up and has a good p-value in M1, 
much like what we saw in the Volcano plot earlier, right? And um, similarly, the line that is connecting uh, this enzyme, IRG1, is thick and green, meaning it's up and has a good p-value in uh, M1 macrophages. Now, what is also very interesting is you see a list of metabolites here, glucose 6-phosphate, FBP, G3P, DHAP, 1,3P, GPEP, pyruvate. And uh, they're all green. The lines connecting them are green as well. And at this point, you know, you'd pick them up as uh, saying that what the data indicates is glycolysis is upregulated in M1 macrophages. Now, this is uh, interesting because it has been published. Uh, glycolysis has been reported to be upregulated in macrophages in many number of studies. But at no point in our um, model, we said that this list of 10 reactions make up glycolysis. So we were very agnostic to any such arbitrary definition which most of the standard pathway analysis approaches take where they define the, these pathways for you in terms of list of reactions. We did not do that. We still recovered that pathway. Now, um, we, we discovered a lot of nuggets which have been reported in literature before. We also discovered some new ones. And I'll focus on one of them in this presentation. So if you look at isocitric acid, that's green, meaning up in M1. The downstream product, 2-oxoglutarate, or AKG, is red, meaning down in M, uh, up, substrate is up, AKG is down in M1, and the line edge connecting these two is also red, which is the enzyme IDH. Now, once you see this pattern, you hypothesize that IDH is disrupted in M1 macrophages, okay? And that is, that is uh, the point we were trying to make. Like, now you have a very clear idea of what the next experiment should be. This is a very testable hypothesis. And that is exactly what we did in the subsequent experiment. We, we labeled all the six carbons of glucose, waited for four hours, lysed the macrophages, and saw how that label flew down uh, in the downstream metabolites. And uh, this is the data that we have. Now, again, uh, these are two panels. One is this corresponds to isocytic acid. This corresponds to AKG. The radius of the circle that you see here uh, is proportional to the concentration. So one thing that you can notice right away is the radius for M1 isocytic acid is much bigger than M0, meaning M isocytic acid is up, which we saw in our previous experiment as well. That was a separate experiment. So you re recapture that. What is interesting and worth focusing more on is this blue slice. This blue slice corresponds to the two-label citric acid. So the way to interpret this is in the last four hours that the cell was exposed to this label, around a quarter of citric acid pool was newly synthesized. All right? Now, when you look at the downstream canonical product, AKG, you don't see that blue slice at all. Now, as a positive control, you do see the same proportion of blue slice in M0 for the isocitric acid as well as for AKG. Now, that, in some ways, you know, confirms the hypothesis that we had posed earlier. Now let's review uh, the kind, different kinds of data we have at this point. By the way, we also did a glutamine feed experiment where we did see labels in AKG as you'd expect. Um, again, I'll skip that. To review, at this point we have four different independent pieces of data. One, the transcript is down, IDH transcript is down. Two, the substrate, citric acid is up in the macrophages. Three, AKG, the product, is down. And fourth, which we argue is the most compelling one, the newly formed product in the four-hour time window is completely absent in M1 macrophages. So all of this is pointing to the same um, hypothesis that we think is confirmed, that IDH in, uh, TC, in M macrophage 1 is disrupted. Now you'd wonder why that would be the case, and uh, there's a very interesting um, description or explanation that we came up with. Uh, itoconic acid is being made by macrophage 1, uh, in tons of it, and it gets excreted. That is the effector molecule that M1s use to kill pathogens. And the substrate for itoconic acid is isocitric acid. So you are essentially rewiring your metabolism to be able to execute the function that you have been assigned to, in this case, M1s. So again, we did a bunch of labeling experiments both for both M1 and M2. This is a summary here, where you see a disrupted TCA cycle uh, for M1s, we talked about one of the disruptions. We did not talk about uh, the disruption at SDH, which uh, is discussed in the paper. Interestingly enough, for M2s, you see almost textbook labeling patterns for all the TCA intermediates. So TCA is behaving as you know, described in textbooks for M2s. So there's a very distinct behavior of metabolomic phenotype, which is associated with the functional phenotype of these macrophages. 
Now, uh, most of this work, all of this work actually, was done when I was still at Argeus. And uh, the data generation part is challenging. Uh, my role and my interests lie on the data analysis part, which was also very tedious and cumbersome when I was working on this uh, experiment at Argeus. And that is precisely what we wanted to address for the community, and uh, which was the reason why we started Elucidata. We want uh, this, such experiments to be done at an industrial scale across all the labs in industry and in academia. And the, the focus that we have is to be able to address the bottlenecks associated with data analysis, processing, interpretation, so on and so forth. And again, um, referring to the challenges of uh, doing data analysis for metabolomics, there are many possible workflows. And here we list just a handful of them. And each one of them demands a slightly different tweak to your, the way you approach to the data, depending also on the question that you're interested in. And all of this heterogeneity essentially um, you know, adds to the tedium and uh, lack of reproducibility in the analysis that is being done. It, of course, uh, makes it very time consuming as well, mostly because most of these steps are manual. And to be able to address these uh, challenges, uh, we got together. This is the team that you see. We are around 40 people in Delhi. Uh, we have worked with 15 different companies, biotech and pharma, over the last three years. We have a pretty active, robust uh, agenda to work with academic labs. We have 10 papers in the pipeline. Some of them are out already. And this, uh, the expertise that we bring to the table is um, a good understanding of mass spec data, uh, computer science, and the context of how this should be used to discover drugs, find targets, to uh, stratify patient population, so on and so forth. And we have had a pretty good run so far. It's been fun. And you know, I'm very happy to be able to represent this team and talk about what we have done uh, over the last you know, three years. Now, in a nutshell, what has come out uh, of our effort is Poly. Poly is a cloud-based data analytics platform, which we argue should be used by any lab that is generating metabolism data. It allows and addresses a lot of the bottlenecks that we just referred uh, to. So if you think about uh, what we call life of data, it starts with an experimental design where you have a question that you want to uh, study. You prepare some samples. You put this plate on your instrument of choice. You generate data. You have to process the raw data, which is highly tedious, error-prone, manual. Once the data has been processed, you do some kind of analysis. And this analysis could be as simple as taking ratio of two metabolites in two groups that you care about, or you know, fitting to a differential equation model. Irrespective of the complexity of the analysis, which should be dictated by the question that you're interested in, we have a number of uh, tools that, on Poly that addresses these questions. Now, once you have analyzed the data, you want to visualize that in some meaningful context, hopefully on a pathway of interest, to get something out of this experiment that you have just run. And at this point, you have answered some of the questions that you posed early on, and you have posed some new questions, which essentially, you know, sets you up to start this all over again. The Poly has been designed as a one-stop shop for this entire journey of data, where you can capture experimental design, do data analysis, do pick picking, and uh, also share and collaborate with your colleagues. There's a poster, uh, which I'll plug, which we are sharing on Thursday. Uh, please go and visit us. Uh, we would be happy to talk more about this. Now, at this point, I'll give you some flavor of like, different workflows and apps that are on Poly, which are currently being used. It would be hard for me to go into details of it, but again, um, I'm here. Uh, I'll be happy to answer questions now or later. Uh, two of my colleagues, uh, Shwetab and Shafali, are here too. So please feel free to reach out to us. And you can also you know, reach out to us through our web uh, and uh, email us. So one of the workflows that we have is Intomix workflow, which uh, is based on the exact algorithm that I described in the first half of my presentation. What it does in a nutshell, it's a very good hypothesis generation tool which integrates your transcriptional and metabolomic data to identify pathways of interest. It's an end-to-end uh, -end workflow, meaning it starts from raw metabolomic data and also raw transcriptional data. Should you have processed metabolomic data, we can you know, use that as well. But we have the capability to go all the way from raw data and within a matter of hours, get to the pathway that is arguably changing based on the data that you acquired in this particular experiment. So this whole uh, thing, uh, process, at least with respect to the data analysis part, has been streamlined where you can reduce this to hours. We already saw one example in the context of murine macrophages. 
uh, Darren from Pfizer uh, had a poster which he shared on Monday, yesterday, where we have applied this workflow to study the role of mTOR inhibition in T cell, human T cell activation. And again, um, it would be hard for me to go into the details of this. Uh, this will be published soon. There's a poster already. I'm sure Darren and I would be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, the point that I would want to reiterate, this is again a very good hypothesis generation tool. We have used this in many settings. This is one such example. And um, the journey from raw data to this pathway map took us in this case, after all the iterations that you go through, in less than 48 hours. So in less than two days, we were presenting back to Darren and his team about what we learned from this particular experiment. Another workflow that we have is uh, poly phi, phi as in the Greek letter phi, for F, for flux, relative workflow. It gives you a qualitative sense of the flow of nutrients in the pathway of your interest. And again, this is end-to-end -end workflow, starts with raw data, uh, does the natural abundance correction, uh, performs some data analysis, and finally lets you visualize that data on the pathway of your choice. We support both uh, LCMS and MSMS data, also high-res and low-res. Again, those are details that, again, we'd be very happy to talk to you about. But uh, the main excitement that we have seen so far is it has reduced the tedium and the time that you take to go from raw data to the pathway map uh, from weeks or hours to you know, a few minutes now. Another example, uh, which, is also, which is also on the poster, uh, based on Selexion technology, where we studied flow of glucose and glutamine in the T cells that we were talking about earlier, human T cells, and we found that when T cells reprogram, their glutamine uh, utilization changes, glucose uh, utilization does not. Now, again, the transition, like going all the way from raw data to this, these flux map that you see, took us less than an hour. Uh, also, like uh, this method, uh, this was using LCMSMS-based data, and uh, the way we have uh, computed uh, flux in this case is based on the paper that came out from Dick Kibbe's lab, uh, published in Cell Metabolism a few years back. We also have a PolyFi Absolute workflow. Again, this is consistent uh, in the way that we have uh, earlier described our approach. So in the first step, you go broad, which, uh, which is enabled by Intomix workflow. Once you have identified the pathway of choice, you want to probe that in qualitative way, and then finally quantitative way in some cases. So all these three workflows are consistent with the approach that we have prescribed. This workflow, um, is rarely used, but in some cases where you want to assign numbers, absolute numbers, to the flow of nutrients through this pathway that you've identified, you can use it. We have used it. We have addressed a lot of uh, data processing uh, bottlenecks, which reduces uh, the, again, journey from raw data to this flux pathway from months to days. And um, since we can do this so fast, what we did was we uh, run, ran a uh, in silico experiment where we took published data from Dick's paper, from the same cell metabolism paper, and we ran thousands of simulations to see how the experimental design shapes or influences the flux that you end up estimating. So uh, this was a time course for all the metabolites shown in this pathway. Again, I'll skip over a lot of details. If you include all the time points, there were seven of them in this experiment, uh, you get a distribution for citric synthase flux, which, shows in the, which is shown in this black solid curve, all, indicated by all. Right? And then we did a sil in silico experiment where we arbitrarily removed one time point at a time and showed how this flux distribution changes. Now we could do this only because you know, doing one flux simulation was very straightforward. It, took, it would took, take us only a few minutes. So you can run thousands of such simulations in a short order of time to make plots like this. Now the takeaway is your experimental design as to what time points did you choose to get the data does influence the flux that you estimate, which is not, you know, it's kind of obvious in hindsight, but there are no systematic structured way to probe those questions. And here we are presenting, uh, which is also now uh, in public domain in bioarchive, as to how this, uh, these simulations were done and what we learned. So if you're interested, we would again be very keen to uh, follow up and address those questions. Now, um, to recap, uh, Poly is the platform that we have built to enable cell metabolism labs so that their discovery can be accelerated by addressing the bottlenecks around data processing, data analysis, data visualization, and also data sharing and collaboration. So that is something that uh, we have been able to do through a cloud-based platform 
the experiments that you do is, are searchable and shareable. Um, it's scalable, meaning uh, you can have one scientist in your lab use it, or 10. It also means that you can upload data sites which are like you know, 10 gigabytes or more. Uh, the platform should work. And most importantly, we also capture almost every parameter that you use through your uh, journey when you go from raw data to that pathway, which enables reproducible analysis. Often, like you know, all of this, all the people in this room would appreciate that it's very hard to keep track of what are the parameter that you use to pick the peaks, or what was the parameter that you used to identify a significant metabolite or not. All of that will be captured for you in Poly, which would enable reproducible analysis for the same scientist two weeks later, or definitely uh, other scientists in the same group or community at large. Again, um, final plugin for the posters. Three of them were already shared uh, Monday. Uh, the first one, the Poly, uh, which is an introduction to the platform that we just talked about, will be shared on Thursday. So we would welcome if you can swing by, ask us questions.